Hello again, everyone. Let's talk a little bit about mycotoxins and their presence in food. So first, uh, we'll talk about what mycotoxins are and are not. We'll talk about the types of mycotoxins that may be found in food, and then we'll give a practical example of mycotoxins in chocolate, one of my favorite foods. So a quick definition, the idea of mycotoxins is that they are produced by filamentous molds and fungi, and we can find them across many different types of staple grains, as well as nuts, uh, some dairy products, and part of this is a result of the feed that cattle are consuming, and then also in coffee and, uh, and cocoa crops. Generally, we divide these uh, mycotoxins into two categories. One is those produced in the field as a result of, uh, of conditions, um, weather-related conditions or conditions related to harvest. The other storage-related uh, fungi, and these are those that will grow after the product has been harvested. And I uh, just want to point out that mushroom toxins are considered separate from mycotoxins, um, even though they're all fungi, of course, just to uh, make sure that you're aware of this arbitrary distinction, you'll typically see that uh, mushroom toxins are not included, even though, of course, they can be quite toxic. So we'll discuss them no further in this particular video. Mycotoxin history goes back a long time. In fact, it probably goes back to the time uh, approximately 10,000 years ago when uh, grains began to be uh, domesticated and used as long-term uh, long food rations. And so we see mention of this in the ancient world repeatedly, and uh, certainly ergot was, was repeatedly mentioned uh, across the ancient world. It was mentioned in uh, pre-1500s Europe um, and may have been a reason for uh, stunting of growth and slowed population growth. Um, so St. Elmo's fire um, is an uh, inhibition of, of circulation, and uh, this was one of the diseases that was frequently described in Europe and may have been a result of consumption of, uh, of rye. And uh, we see that through the 1800s the, and into the 1900s, we have descriptions of, uh, of fungal toxins, cardiac beriberi, affecting perfectly healthy uh, young males in, um, in Japan. And uh, we, we have, uh, during World War II, some of the, the grains that actually stayed in the field over the winter uh, were consumed just by, by people that were starving. And, and uh, this ended up killing a significant portion of the population due to one particular fungal toxin. Mycotoxins didn't really have a name until the early 60s. So the name mycotoxin really originated with this study of turkey X disease in, um, in England. And the idea then was that uh, this, this term mycotoxin was coined as a result of that particular study. Throughout the 60s and 70s, many different type of, types of mycotoxins were actually identified. And then uh, today, we now recognize that uh, multiple mycotoxins may work together um, in their toxic effects. We know that the microbiome um, may also influence the toxicity of the mycotoxins that we consume on a regular basis. And then there are also emerging mycotoxins, new, uh, new species of fungi and therefore new species of mycotoxins that we may not have been aware of in our food supply before. There are uh, a number of different structures that mycotoxins possess and um, uh, just in terms of characterizing them, um, they generally have low molecular weight. You'll see cyclic and acyclic ring structures and uh, the thing to take home about this is just even minor variations in the uh, in the structure of these can produce very significant effects and uh, differences in terms of toxicity and the type of physiological effects that we see. So, uh, one practical application of this difference, minor differences in structure having major differences on the actual effect, is the. Uh, the, the invention of lysergic acid dimethyl, or LSD. This was invented uh, in the late 30s by Albert Hoffman and then used by the military uh, in mind control, control experiments through the 50s and probably into the 70s. Of course, it was uh, used as a, a recreational drug in the 60s, and it was a famous song by the Beatles, of course, um, Lucy in the Sky. So, uh, so this uh, ergot-related uh, alkaloid that had been mentioned um, uh, hundreds and even thousands of years previous was slightly modified to produce mainly hallucinogenic effects um, and isolate the, away the other toxic properties. So there are different ways to classify mycotoxins, and one way is to classify them in terms of the organ systems that they affect. So you can see that they, uh, they affect a wide range of organ systems, everything from heart to, uh, to liver, immunity, uh, kidneys, uh, nerves, as well as uh, having reproductive effects. And then on the side of the, the disease is actually caused, we, we can see anything from reproductive related uh, birth defects, we can see, uh, we can see brain hemorrhages, uh, cancer, we can see uh, uh, effects on cardiac muscle, 
we can have um, uh, immune suppression to the point where opportunistic infections take over. And this was certainly the case with that wheat that had uh, overwintered in the fields in Russia, a um, particular type of disease that resulted in severe immune suppression, kidney failure, um, precocious or early puberty, and then spontaneous abortion. So a very wide range of conditions and a very wide range of organ systems affected by different types of, of mycotoxins. And here's a, a table um, that I'll let you look through. This, this actually lists particular types of mycotoxins on the left and the species that uh, that produce them, the foods that are affected, uh, and of course you can see their major staple grains as well as uh, as well as peanuts and, uh, and and tree nuts as well, and then the toxic effects on the right hand side. So this is by no means an exhaustive table, but it's just designed to give you an idea of some of the mycotoxins that we see in foods on a regular basis. So quite a large uh, array of them uh, related to uh, related to the foods that we consume on an everyday basis. In terms of uh, estimated costs, just aflatoxin alone appears to be uh, be the cause of over 100,000 deaths per year. Uh, the primary issue there is liver cancer, which is one of the chronic effects, the long-term effects of, of consumption of aflatoxin over time. There's also this stunting effect in, in, uh, in children. So we, we may see uh, significant uh, uh, stunting over a, a number of populations that are, that are typically consuming this. And then um, certainly a loss of crops. So when it's identified um, in countries where there is uh, there's sufficient um, uh, sufficient resources to test for it, uh, for instance in the U.S., then uh, above a certain level, those uh, those crops cannot be used for food, and uh, and above that level, they can't be used for feed for animals either. So those crops might be completely lost, and uh, that's that's where that 300 million dollar figure comes from. So this is just one single myco mycotoxin out of the many mycotoxins that we uh, that we deal with on a regular basis. So I wanted to give you a practical example here, and that's mycotoxins in chocolate. So uh, one of the things that uh, is important to, to, to know, of course, is that uh, the inventor of, uh, of Snoopy was a big chocolate lover, and you can see his, his quote here, um, all you need is love, but a little chocolate now and then doesn't hurt. So I think that's a pretty nice quote. Um, when you're making chocolate, it goes through a wide range of steps, and one of those steps happens to be fermentation. Um, and then you can see the rest of the steps. We're going to focus on that, that first step of fermentation and how important that is in terms of the succession of microorganisms that may result in uh, eventually the formation of mold. So when we think about making chocolate, one of the first things that, uh, that happens is after harvest, the uh, cacao pod, and cacao is just the unprocessed material, this cacao pod is open, and what you see are, is a sort of a white, uh, gummy, pasty material covering what will eventually become the cocoa beans um, that are going to get converted to chocolate. So that material um, has significant amount of sucrose and it can be fermented then to glucose and fructose. All of these can be uh, can be good substrates for the growth of a variety of microorganisms. And that's exactly what we see is that those uh, microorganisms present in the environment take advantage of this. And this is why that first step of chocolate production is actually fermentation. And then that, fermenta that, that fermentation will result in the production of particular flavors when that material is roasted and, uh, and Maillard browning takes place. So uh, cocoa beans are fermented in a variety of ways um, around the world. In some cases, they're just heap heaped up and allowed to ferment in a large, um, in a large pile. In other cases, they may be in, in baskets, wooden or plastic. They can be in trays or bins. Sometimes they're covered with burlap or not. So they're fermented in a, in a uh, wide variety of different ways. And depending on how they're fermented and also the types of microorganisms present in the environment, then what we see is, um, is, is differences in the microbial population. So the idea then is that these cocoa beans um, inwardly are undergoing an enzymatic change. So the beans, as fermentation occurs, are actually dying. And so often you'll see that the unfermented beans appear either uh, white or even surprisingly purple. Um, and then once the fermentation has, has finished, you'll see that they take on a brownish appearance through um, enzymatic browning. So we're getting not only outward microbial fermentation, but we're, we're getting inward enzymatic effects um, from, the, from the plant itself. Now, over a, approximately eight days, what we see is that there is a succession of microbes that ferment, uh, that ferment the cocoa beans. And some of them are very desirable and some of them are not. Uh, yeast, lactic acid, and acetic acid bacteria are very desirable. They actually produce some of the flavor precursors that uh, are then uh, 
<clears throat> that then appear when uh, when the, the beans are roasted. If we get out today, four and five typically, and of course this is going to vary based on region and humidity and temperature, but if we get out typically past day four, we're going to start seeing spore forming uh, bacteria and beyond that mold. And this is the this is the part we, we want to avoid. So uh, the first three sets of microbes, yeast, lactic acid, bacteria, and acetic acid bacteria, generally desirable. The others, not so much. So, uh, so these molds can grow on the, on the cocoa beans. One of the things that I want to point out, and this is true of staple grains, this is true of other products, the, the very fact that there is mold growing on a material doesn't absolutely mean that mycotoxins are present. So uh, one of the take-homes uh, from this lesson should be that mycotoxins are not just a result of mold growing, but they're often a result of mold growing under stress of some sort. Um, and so mycotoxins are all, often produced as a result of this stress response. This means potentially that um, this, this may be a way of combating uh, mycotoxin production by preventing the stresses that may cause this formation. So um, some published data here on uh, Brazilian chocolate products, and this is just one article out of a number, but just to give you an idea of the prevalence of mycotoxins and the, uh, the amount, because of course, as we know, it's the dose that really matters. So in terms of aflatoxin found in, in the majority of Brazilian chocolate products, but at very low levels. So as you'll see on the next page is 0 0.35, um, 0 0.35 parts per billion um, in terms of aflatoxin. And then in terms of okra toxin, uh, 0.5 parts per billion, even though it's found in 98% of the samples, is considered fairly low. Now, the highest concentrations are found in, uh, unfortunately, dark chocolate and cocoa powder. I love both of those. Uh, so that's where it's found in the highest concentration, uh, significantly less in the cocoa butter uh, part of the, uh, the chocolate product. We, uh, in our lab, actually ran some analysis on, uh, on chocolate products, and we used a Vicam AFLA test in order to, uh, in order to look at the uh, aflatoxin content. And we, we found that all of our chocolate samples uh, were below 12 parts per billion. So um, that's the good news. The bad news is that, uh, is that the action level for FDA, meaning the level at which um, those products should no longer be sold or consumed, is anything above 20 parts per billion. So we like to see levels that are lower than this, but we, we did um, actually look at this uh, to some degree. So in summary, um, mycotoxins uh, date back quite a long time in, in terms of human history. Uh, the toxins that are produced by fungi, remember mushrooms are separate, the toxins produced by, by non-mushroom fungi are very diverse, produce a very wide range of toxic effects, anything from stunting to cancer to hallucina hallucinations, um, and they may, may be formed in one of two places, in the field or during storage. Uh, they are very, very common. As you saw, most of the Brazilian chocolate had aflatoxin and okra toxin present. And uh, finally, one of the keys to try to, to try to think about how to lower the levels of these things is try to understand why mycotoxins are produced. So if they're produced as stress responses, can we eliminate that stress response or do something else to prevent the uh, formation of these mycotoxins either in the field or during storage? So I hope you've enjoyed this very brief overview of mycotoxins. There are a number of references here that I've, I'm leaving for you. Lots and lots of information with regard to mycotoxins, but I wanted to give you just this quick overview. All right, thank you so much for your time and attention. Take care. Talk to you later. Bye.